I wanted to thank everyone for joining us this morning um, and welcome you to our ABNY Talks with Mary Bassett, the New York State um, Health Commissioner. You know, it's really important uh, that we have these conversations and we're really proud of our ABNY Talks series um, because it's a really important part of our programming here at ABNY. You know, this series really allows us to bring timely and relevant topics to our membership and more importantly, to the general public for meaningful discussions about the things that impact our lives every day. And ABNY Talks really is a series that is free of charge and it's meant to be educational and participatory. And it's really a great way to pass on information that will keep our city moving forward and really to keep our city strong. And in this moment, when we are navigating the strategies and the practices to deal with the current phase of COVID, we know how important it is to be up to date on the newest guidance from our public health professionals. And that's why we are really excited to bring you today's ABNY Talks. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Stephen Rubenstein, ABNY's chairman, to introduce today's speaker. Stephen, zoom over to you. Thank you, Melba, as always. Um, morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, as Melba mentioned, uh, we are lucky to have uh, our state health commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, with us uh, this morning. We are excited to hear from her, and given the times we're in, we have a lot of questions for her. Um, I know many people on this Zoom feel we are over and done with this pandemic. We are glad that our masks are coming off, but we all have a second feeling, which is, is this pandemic done with us? And if you're on the Zoom, if you're in our community, you tend to pay a fair amount of attention to whether what's happening in New York as well as trends around the world. To understand these facts, understand where we are now, what it really means for New York, we're lucky to turn today to Dr. Bassett. This is Dr. Bassett's first time with us in her current role with the state. Many of us know her and have felt her calm and controlled wisdom and voice during the 2014 Ebola scare when she served as New York City's health commissioner, a position she held for four and a half years. We were lucky to have her on the front lines then and we're lucky to have her on the front lines now. Dr. Bassett has an extensive background in infectious diseases, including nearly 20 years spent confronting the AIDS epidemic in Africa, with over 15 of those years spent living in Zimbabwe, where she served on the medical faculty of the University of Zimbabwe. She is one of the world's most sought after experts on the intersection of equity and public health, something vital to our pandemic response here in the city and the state. I wanna extend a big thank you to Dr. Bassett, as well as her New York City counterparts. Since the early days of this pandemic, city and state officials have been really careful and exemplary in communicating with New York as a whole, as well as working with ABNY, our business and civic community throughout, something that has really been vital as we all coped. We're grateful for the partnership we have with her, as well as with Governor Hochul, and look forward to a healthy future together. And I should say, because as much as the pandemic dominates so much of our lives, our behavior and our conversations at this time, we also know it is just one of the issues facing us as we to have a healthy and well-being of our city and state. So welcome to ABNY, Commissioner Bassett. Thank you for being here and the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to join you this morning. And thank you, Melva. And thank you, Steve, for a really lovely introduction. So I'm going to be talking about where we stand with COVID and talk a little bit about um, how we're thinking about how we go forward. Um, and I'm going to be showing you quite a lot of data to do that. Uh, and I'll look forward also at the end to having your questions. I'm gonna go over um, the sort of waves of COVID as they've blown across the state and the nation, uh, what we're seeing now and end with what we've learned uh, over the course of this response. Um, uh, and I, you know, I've only been uh, health commissioner for part of this response. Um, you, here you see on this slide, the. Um, the waves of, of COVID that have been experienced in New York uh, State. This uh, first one uh, was the one that was the most devastating. New York uh, State and in particular New York City were the gateway uh, for uh, COVID for the nation. And uh, the toll that uh, COVID took in, in wave one, I think you can see my pointer here, uh, still places New York State in the top 10 of, uh, of, uh, of deaths in the nation um, because we uh, had so few tools and 
we this was a once in a century event, but it's been followed by other waves. And you can see that there's a seasonal pattern. So uh, the winter surge uh, was followed by a, a, a uptick uh, related to a new variant. There have been five uh, variants identified by the World Health Organization. And the ones that have been important in the United States were Delta and most recently Omicron, uh, which was a stunningly infectious, uh, but fortunately not as lethal in terms of the percent of people who were infected who who succumbed to COVID. But still, in this state, uh, since December first, we've lost ten thousand people, uh, presumably most of them to Omicron. Now, the Omicron. Um, uh, uh, sort of spike, uh, wave, whatever we want to call it. It was uh, really like a cliff. This was the Omicron sign of the vertical rise in case counts is clearly coming to an end. Uh, we have, um, have seen a real decline in the number of uh, cases. Uh, you know, this, it really went up and now it's coming down. Uh, uh, we expect that the tail will be longer than the surge, uh, but um, it's clear that the uh, Omicron surge is coming to an end and with it have uh, come uh, many of the, um, of the requirements have been lifted. Um, I, you know, throughout the COVID um, pandemic, we've seen an unequal impact across communities. Uh, uh, in particular, communities of color have borne the brunt of, uh, of excess mortality uh, due to COVID, uh, with uh, rates still double that of the nation. But in the early days, we were seeing threefold, three, fourfold higher mortality rates among African Americans and later Latinos as compared to whites. Uh, I think many of us saw Omicron as sort of such a, a wildfire of infection. We were up to not over 90,000 cases a day in New York State uh, being diagnosed that uh, we, uh, some may have lost uh, track of the fact that we were continuing to see these disparities in, um, in impact. Uh, so it, not only during Delta, uh, but also during Omicron here, you can see it here. Uh, the, this is African-Americans and the hospitalization rate went up to twofold uh, that as compared to, to whites. That's the, the line here is, white, is, uh, is whites. We, we still don't fully understand uh, why the impact on, uh, was particularly on African-Americans. And I'll, I'll come back uh, New York City has done a lot of delving into this, and I'll come back uh, later to talking about some of the reasons that um, that we we uh, what we think this pattern was seen. But here uh, you can see as it surged, the gap uh, widened, and it went up to a twofold higher risk of hospitalizations. Uh, but here we are now uh, with the Omicron uh, surge. Uh, coming down, as you've seen he here in the red, uh, co-temporous with the rise in case counts that was coming, and the hospitalization is a lagging indicator. Um, you know, first you get people infected, then some of them will get sick enough to need to be hospitalized. And, uh, and then of those, uh, among those who are, are very sick, we will see some deaths. Uh, this line here is a little bit subtle, but it's an important point. We know that uh, vaccination particularly protects against uh, serious disease, the type of disease that can land you up in a hospital. And as the hospitalizations rose uh, during the Omicron surge, uh, we saw a real uptick. This is the rate of vaccination. So not the proportion of people who are vaccinated, but the, uh, the um, uh, rate at which people were seeking vaccination. And it really went up as people became concerned about the Omicron surge, but you can see what's happening now. Uh, that the rate of vaccination has been steadily declining and it has sort of pretty much stalled. This is not good. 
because vaccination remains one of our key tools in, um, in, in, in preventing serious illness in particular. And uh, we are doing well compared to the nation, uh, but we are not doing as well as we sh could do or should do. Uh, for this highly contagious variant. So on this graph, you'll see the breakdown of, um, of vaccination by population age groups. And, and you'll see uh, that we're doing really well among people who are older, um, over the age of 65, uh, we're seeing virtual universal primary course. Uh, that means the two doses for most people, immunocompromised people are We'll get three doses. Uh, but here you'll see that in children um, who became uh, eligible for vaccination the last uh, in this group, the five to 11 year olds, we're still just over uh, a third. That means two thirds of children who are eligible in this age group uh, haven't been vaccinated. Now it's important that they be vaccinated for 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 a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that they'll they um, protect themselves, uh, but also even as we have not seen the full protection that we saw against the initial variant, um, the, it does offer protection. Uh, so it also reduces community transmission when you have children vaccinated. Uh, now. Uh, we are recommending boosters for everyone who is 12 and older. Uh, they were recommended first for older adults and all old adults and for um, uh, 15, uh, 16 and 17 year olds. And now for all people who are 12 and over. And, and you can see in this graph um, where we start with 16 and 17 year olds that the younger groups are, have the lowest booster rates. But still, um, not to get too wonky here, if you multiply out, even in the older group who have two thirds of our deaths have been in people over 65, if you multiply out 95 times 70, which will give you the um, percent, which will give you the, the percent of people who've gotten all of the recommended shots, the primary course and the boost, uh, we're still on the 60 percentages. And that's not high enough. We, uh, for, we really need to uh, get the booster rates up for everybody who's uh, boosted, um, uh, who, who's eligible rather, and uh, as well as get everybody who is eligible to be vaccinated, vaccinated. This remains uh, a key protection against serious disease, which we didn't have when the variant arrived. And it's important for children because during Omicron, we saw more um, of uh, children affected than we did uh, during the, um, during the uh, first surge. Uh, we have, um, as a nation, uh, we estimate that about a third of children, that's children uh, under the age of 18, uh, who've died during, uh, during the pandemic, died during the Omicron surge. And in New York State, our numbers are about that. Uh, we had, had 17 children die since the beginning of this year. Um, and uh, so that's, what's that, January, February, March, and, um, 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 uh, and we've had uh, 40, 41 children died in the preceding 17 months. So, Omicron uh, had a higher toll, uh, was more likely to uh, get, uh, have a child hospitalized. And this graph shows the proportion of, uh, of deaths in young people who are not supposed to die, uh, really uh, very, you know, changed with the surge. And so this is an important point um, to, to, to keep hammering home, uh, although the risk in children is low. Uh, the, these are children who we owe the highest responsibility for protection. And we do see children dying in New York State, about 29% of the deaths in children under 18 uh, due to COVID have been um, since uh, uh, related to the Omicron surge. So now I'm gonna take a moment and talk about what we're all hearing about, uh, which is the the fact that we have a uh, uh, have uh, are seeing a rise in cases um, around around the world, uh, 
Uh, we're probably looking most closely at the United Kingdom and Europe um, because Asia, uh, the situation in Asia, particularly in China and Hong Kong, is, is different uh, than in the United States. Uh, as you know, China has pursued, pursued a, a zero case uh, policy using quite draconian methods of shutdown uh, to try and close down any outbreaks. And uh, in uh, Hong Kong in particular, where they're seeing um, a, a really serious surge at the moment, uh, their elders were not vaccinated. I've just shown you data showing that older people uh, had to have the highest vaccination coverage um, here in the United States and also in Europe. So we've been looking at uh, Europe, particularly the UK, which historically um, what happened in the UK would be followed, um, it would, would reach uh, New York in a couple of weeks. And here you can see um, that they are experiencing a rise. Uh, and that rise is due to this very crafty virus, uh, which continues to, to mutate. You, you, I mentioned that we've had five uh, major variants, two of which have had big impact in the United States. Um, aside from the original strain, uh, there, was, um, there was the uh, D Delta variant and then the Omicron variant. But, but the Omicron variant itself is changing. Uh, the initial variant shown in this, I don't know what to call this, a darker but not darkest blue uh, was here. Uh, and then we started seeing um, a, a, a different uh, version of the original uh, variant. Uh, uh, this is the original one is BA1, this one was 1.1, and you can see the dark blues started crowding out the original variant. And here comes the one that everybody's talking about, the BA2 variant. And you can see that it is crowding out uh, the, um, the uh, other variants. And in Asia and in the United Kingdom, it now is clearly the dominant variant. Uh, we haven't seen the kind of astronomical rise uh, with in, in BA2 that's been documented in Europe and uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom. You, you can see it's going up. Uh, the last number I had before this 42% uh, was 39%. Uh, so it went from 39% to 42%. So it's going up, uh, but it's not, um, we, 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 uh, we're watching it, but we haven't seen the huge escalation and rapid increase that was seen in the UK. Uh, we have some other tools uh, in addition to tools to protect people. Uh, we have uh, some emerging tools on how to keep track of the virus. Uh, and uh, this is a, a really useful strategy, which is still being brought on board. You, this is a graph of wastewater surveillance in the United States. Uh, this is us. You can see that most of the wastewater surveillance that's going on in the country is in the Midwest and on the East Coast. But we in New York are you know, part of this early adopters of wastewater surveillance. And the thing that's good about this, something like 85% of, uh, of people are on on, uh, are on sewage. Um, I know it's in the morning, but uh, so I'll use the word wastewater mainly. Uh, and this covers 75% of the population. So we get a, a, a passive window into what's going on in terms of shedding viruses um, without having pe people having to do anything. And uh, we are, have been tracking that. Uh, this is what well, uh, wastewater look like, um, uh, the, I guess these data, it, they go up every week. Uh, these data are from uh, a week ago. They were just updated today. So I'm gonna show you that. Uh, in general, you probably know that when we graph stuff, red is meaning something more serious is going on. Uh, so we are picking up uh, more, uh, more, uh, uh, of the uh, variant, um, BA2 variant in wastewater across the state. Uh, we expected this. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, because we have one, a more contagious variant, it's anywhere from 30 to 50% more contagious. We're relaxing uh, our restrictions. Uh, people are mixing more. Uh, you know, at the beginning, we talked about how everybody's kind of getting tired of all this. Uh, so 
you know, uh, that as long as we have uh, COVID with us, um, this is going to be um, uh, accompanied by more infection. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to our ability to predict this with um, with wastewater. I, I don't know if you how well you can read this. This is applying our data retrospectively to the Omicron surge. And you can see here what was the first signal from wastewater, which was uh, about a week before we saw cases begin to go up. So this will really be helpful to us as we go forward. Um, we're seeing a slight uh, modest increase in, in cases, uh, but as you saw on an earlier slide, um, I feel like I have to take you back to that slide. Where is it? Oh dear, way back <laughs> here. As you could see in this earlier slide, when we're talking about upticks, and this is central New York here, we're talking a, a, against a base that is far lower uh, than it has been in, in months. Uh, the, we're down to levels that we last saw in July and August of last year. So I hope I won't make everybody dizzy as I go forward again to catch up to where I should be in my remarks. Um, so I, I think in the last couple of minutes, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we've learned. Uh, we've, we've learned a, a lot about how, the, um, how things that existed way before Omicron um, regarding the impact of racism in, in our society, uh, which uh, is often anti-Black uh, racism, but extends to all people of color uh, had an impact on the inequities that we saw in hospitalization rates. Uh, and this was related to numbers of things. And this reflects the thinking of our colleagues in the New York City Health Department. Uh, people who, who are low wage workers were more likely to have jobs that uh, meant they had to leave the home uh, and couldn't work remotely as I was able to do during um, the whole of COVID. Uh, there also have been uh, concerns about vaccination that led to delays in vaccination and concerns about seeking health care uh, for numbers of reasons uh, that meant that people were more likely to be diagnosed later in their disease. The data also show that the therapeutics, which we want people to understand, are now available to them. Uh, I, I think that probably there's not enough understanding that people with mild or moderate symptoms who test positive ought to uh, call their healthcare provider right away and have a conversation about whether they should get uh, either monoclonals or antivirals. But uh, we know that the uptake among Black New Yorkers of, uh, of treatment has been lower. Uh, and of, of course, um, you know, we, we can't completely unpack that, that, um, that the data that I showed you on the twofold increase in hospitalization, because we don't have a lot of details about uh, what was making people sick, whether they had other underlying conditions, which are also stratified by race in our society that made them more likely to have a bad outcome. So, you know, we have a, a real challenge to address um, underlying factors that drove the contours of our epidemic. Uh, we, uh, we know that this, uh, you know, is linked to our history as a nation. Uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that one of the outcomes of COVID is that we're prepared to talk about it um, more forthrightly, uh, to use words like racism and to talk about the ways in which that has modified the impact of the epidemic. Uh, we're shifting increasingly to talking about uh, ways of individuals uh, seeking and using uh, the tools that are available to them to protect themselves. And there's a real chance that this will be stratified by people's resources, which in our society are deeply stratified by um, not only by education and income, but by race, ethnicity. Uh, as we make this shift, 
uh, away from statewide requirements. Uh, I want to make clear that um, as a gov state government, we continue to uh, uh, to adhere to what we view as truly core responsibilities. Uh, we need to keep track of things and uh, be able to tell people uh, where we stand with the pandemic using novel strategies like wastewater surveillance. We have an obligation to make sure that if we want people to be tested, that they have access to testing. Increasingly, that's not only testing sites, which remain open, uh, but also home uh, test kits. And if we want people to get vaccinated, we need uh, them to have access to vaccination and uh, you know, continue to sound, um, provide information on therapeutics. Uh, but of course, uh, much of this will lie now with individuals. Um, we want people to make a decision based on their own risks. I often refer, and I have her permission, uh, to my mother, who is 94 years old. Um, and, um, and, you know, she is at very high risk if she gets infected. I take great care uh, because I see her regularly and I uh, consider her risk uh, when I consider my behavior. Um, so I wear masks in crowded indoor spaces uh, and so on. Uh, we, of course, do still have um, uh, some of these tools, um, these, um, these mandates in, in place. We're continuing to require um, ma masking, um, public transportation and healthcare settings and nursing homes. Uh, and, you know, businesses and other entities can continue um, to require masking. I believe, I don't know if this has changed, that Broadway is still uh, looking at masking for theater goers. And of course, everybody, including myself, uh, should feel free to wear a mask in settings where they feel that that would give them the protection that they want. Um, we've really gone all out on making test kits available. We've distributed over 50 million tests. We're sending out uh, uh, additional kits to food banks and um, electeds and local communities and senior centers. Um, and uh, we continue to um, broadcast to the treatment community that um, you know, that, that they should prescribe uh, and we want to broadcast to the public that they should ask, uh, have symptoms, get tested, uh, talk to your healthcare provider. And of course, I've talked a lot about, um, about um, the need for um, uh, the need for vaccination. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we have a really good budget this year uh, with uh, resources allocated uh, to help rebuild our health system. Uh, we also have a big problem with trust. Uh, I'm really pleased to see these data that show that people trust their nurses most of all. Uh, but unfortunately, governments, the trust in government um, and, and health departments, <laughs> here's the state health department, 41% of people uh, are not what they should be. And so we have our work cut out for us uh, to, uh, to regain the public's trust. And uh, I hope that by you know, sharing what we know, uh, being clear about what we don't know, uh, that we will be on the path to doing that. The numbers that you showed us in terms of uh, vaccinations uh, in particular, are there grant? Are there still disparities throughout the state? Is downstate in New York City much more vaccinated? Yes, it is. And yeah, particularly in North Country, Southern Tier, and parts of Central New York, we in general we have lower vaccination rates upstate than downstate. The ratio. I think we've done a really good job with what was received a lot of attention early in the pandemic about the. Uh, you know, about skepticism of vaccination uh, among African Americans. And uh, we've done a really good job, although among young African American men, we still have lower vaccination rates than I'd like. Uh, but the bigger divides are more, uh, frankly, along um, what, you know, what I would broadly describe as, pol as political lines. Uh, unfortunately, um, Although a virus obviously doesn't care how you vote, um, the um, the attitudes towards vaccination have really been col colored by uh, by partisan politics. 
how do you get around that in terms of overcoming that as, as you've done your work so far? Well, you know, the, I, I think people respond to, to mandate. They did respond to mandates and we really boosted our vaccination rates with the mandates. And the other is uh, the people respond to searches. Uh, you saw that there was a real uptick in, uh, in the rate at which people were going out to get vaccinated as Omicron arrived in the state. People uh, went out and got vaccinated. And I, you know, I think that as the transmission lines, which it has declined, it's been a remarkable you know, up and down, uh, that people's um, you know, sort of interest and concern about getting vaccinated has dissipated. Uh, but this is really a tool that we have is, uh, that will protect people clearly against serious illness. And um, uh, so I, I think what will work is just keeping at it. And, um, and you know, the numbers are keep edging up. Our nursing homes, we're doing well. We have 70% of nursing home residents boosted. Um, and 90% are fully vaccinated. But as I told you, nine times seven is 63% uh, of residents have gotten the full benefit of, um, of all of the recommended shots. So, but still 70% boosted is good. And so we just, you know, uh, we just keep at it. You talked about um, your being careful because your, your mother is, is, mm. is uh, potentially in a vulnerable community. Do you look at kids below the age of five as also in a, a vulnerable community at this point who are not vaccinated? Well, as everybody knows, the risk of, of serious illness and death is low in kids. But I, you know, I personally feel that every society, you know, seeks to protect maximally its children. And uh, so I, I understood why New York City uh, made the decision to uh, to maintain um, masks for under fives for a bit for a bit longer. Uh, and this is um, completely consistent with what the state has indicated that everyone can look at their, um, you know, at local jurisdictions uh, can tailor their recommendations to their setting. Now, of course, uh, that has now been, the, the, it's been announced it'll be lifted. I'm not sure that it's happened yet. Uh, but what we want for our kids is zero risk. Uh, well, we, we can never provide them with that. Uh, there, you know, there is no zero risk um, in, uh, for virtually anything, uh, but we can, um, we can protect them and protect the under fives who are not vaccine eligible by trying to make sure that everyone around them is vaccinated and uh, sort of think of it as a wall of protection around the littlest kids. And, and does the Moderna data that, that they disclosed, I guess it was yesterday, um, do, does that give you, did, did that data seem reasonable to you that it would reach approval and that would be beneficial or? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, we, we've, so far we have never gone out ahead of the FDIA and the CDC. So, um, you know, we are, I, I think, you know, boosters, uh, additional boosters are coming. Uh, vaccinations for the small kids are coming. I, I do want to point out that um, that the best protection for very young kids, kids under six months, is a is a is a vaccinated mother. And um, I think many people worry when they're pregnant that I shouldn't have anything medical touching me. But it would it's a good idea and recommended if you're unvaccinated and you're and, uh, and you're pregnant that you get vaccinated. It's a way of protecting your your child. One byproduct of the pandemic has been seeming to be an increase of the mm -hmm. mental health challenges people yeah. are having. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about how you approach that? And, and, and I assume that will be with us it for, some, for some time. Ask how you prioritize That's a really that. good point. And I, I mean, I think all of us, uh, you know, have, ex this has been a really difficult time um, for everybody. Uh, but children uh, have, you know, been displaying uh, really worrying signs with, um, with data showing an increase in anxiety and depression and an increase in, even in suicide attempts. At the state level, the Office of um, 
of mental health is separate from the health department. It's led by Ann Sullivan, who uh, I had the pleasure of working with when I was the city health commissioner. She came from, and, and so she's been working on numbers of programs. I think the place to work on this is in schools. We, 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 we clearly have learned uh, that, uh, that going forward, a key um, place to keep as safe as we can uh, is our schools so that we uh, can keep kids in schools. And that uh, I've heard uh, former health commissioner, Dave Chakshi talk about, you know, how he would say he regrets um, that the schools were closed sort of precipitously when they hit a magic number 3%. Uh, it was really important for, for our, us to have kids back in school. It's good for their socialization, their mental health, and of course their learning. Um, so anyway, I, I think that the place to focus our mental health efforts really are in schools and in pediatricians offices. Um, so that's the kind of work that we're talking about. Another long-term effect uh, is long COVID. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. We understand very little about it. There are a number of hypotheses about it, uh, but that's why it's always better not to get COVID because we don't know why some people, apparently healthy, athletic, fit people have gone on to have long COVID. Um, and, um, and that will be with us for a while. And there's no reason not to think that Omicron, which infected very many people, um, might not also be associated with long COVID. So we have the mental health impact of the pandemic. We have the long health, potentially long COVID. And of course we have all of the economic and social disruptions that occurred. Uh, so even as it trails off, it's not over. And, and in class, talking about the surge in, in, in Omicron, um, there was a narrative out there in the last few months that like hundreds of thousands to millions of people were walking around with asymptomatic COVID and no yeah. idea that they have it. Do yeah. you have the feeling, one, that, that, that much more of us had it than realized, and you get the feeling with BA2 that, that's... that may be helping us now that we have a higher, I mean, clearly we have higher population immunity than, um, than, uh, than Asia um, and, and China, particularly where they had the, the zero transmission strategy that meant that they didn't have people acquiring immunity from natural infection. And that's one of the beauties of wastewater surveillance is that it doesn't require people to seek testing to identify uh, to identify it. Uh, we don't really know uh, what proportion of people had asymptomatic infection. We haven't really done any, um, you know, population surveys. Um, a lot of the, the focus has been on people who have come forth, but there's no doubt that in, with that Omicron. Uh, had a hot, much higher proportion of people who were infected with mild or no symptoms. Uh, all of us have heard of people, right, who uh, in our own personal lives who, you know, got tested and found out they were infected and didn't really have much in the way of symptoms. So uh, it may be that that's part of what's molding um, uh, what so far uh, seems to be uh, 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 you know, a, a growth in cases, which, uh, but not uh, this type of growth. Uh, but we're keeping an eye on it. In central New York, which is where Syracuse is located, we're, we're definitely seeing more cases now. And uh, so, you know, um, I, I think the, the, the word is vigilance, uh, but we know that we have all these tools now uh, that we didn't have before both in terms of surveillance, uh, uh, protection, and, uh, and, and treatment. Um, so, you know, we're beginning to view this as something that we're going to have to live with. And, um, and the word eliminate or eradicate, you won't hear coming much from people in public health. Well, that then leads to two important questions. You, you use the words vigilance. So vigilance means something for you as, as the commissioner responsible for the whole state. What does vigilance mean 
for the people on this Zoom who maybe are thought obviously themselves, their families, and and and, pass, and their and their and their coworkers and loved ones. It means to me that each of you should think of first of all, are there people around you who aren't vaccinated who could be vaccinated who aren't boosted and could be boosted, or, or does that include some of you? And you know, this is time to think again about whether or not you want to proceed to get all of the recommended shots. Uh, and then, you know, we have all these test kits. Uh, if you have flu-like symptoms, and uh, so that means fever, runny nose, cough, um, and even diarrhea. Um, uh, I, I have friends who that was their first symptom of COVID. Test yourself and find out. If you test positive, call your healthcare provider and have a conversation about whether uh, you should uh, should have uh, have treatment. Um, and of course, you know, I, I mentioned that I continue to use my masks. Uh, of course, I wear them on public transport where they're still required. Um, but I also, when I'm in crowded indoor spaces, because I have a very, a potentially very vulnerable family member, and we may not always know whether we're infected or not, right? So I take, uh, I, I consider that when I, um, in, 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 um, in determining my own behavior. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the best advice that I can give right now, that, um, that as ever, it's always useful to think about the most vulnerable person in your circle and what kind of protection you would like them to have. So initial, um, let's say information about masking was you mask to protect the person you're next to. Yes. Has that changed? Are you now with a better mask? Are you really protecting yourself? Yes, yes. We're using high quality masks. I always have one nearby. I mean, this is a material. This, this, is really... this, is a, this is not an N95, it's, uh, it, it, but it's, you know, it's a well-fitting mask. And when I go on a, on a Amtrak, which I do quite a bit, uh, I, I wear a higher quality mask. I wear an N95 and they protect me. Uh, but they also protect others. And I, I, I think that's a nice way. I ran into a young woman at one of the um, uh, convenience shops in the Albany train station. She said, I get vaccinated to protect myself and I wear my mask to protect all of us. Uh, you know, we no longer have them required. Um, and I know all of us are sick of seeing people covered up and so on. But I hope that when you see somebody wearing a mask, uh, you, you feel like that's okay. That's what they decided to do for them. Um, you said this will, we, we're, not, we're not using the word eliminate anymore. Mm. Um, but what does that look like in the future? Is it, um, you're, we're reacting to surges? Is it uh, this constant reference to it's like the flu? I guess I would say is, do you think the fear factor changes for people in terms of how they interact? with the universe because public health outcomes change or does it sort of yeah. feel like it does now for a long time? Well, I think, you know, we've had a whole series of prominent people announced that they tested positive recently. I think the most recent one I heard of was Hillary Clinton. And often there'll be an additional refrain, I'm fully vaccinated and boosted, so I'm not very worried. So I think that, you know, that, you know, that there'll increasingly be a willingness to accept, um, you know, have uh, an illness. Uh, what we should really not accept is, uh, is preventable mortality. We should never accept it from any cause. And um, so I, you know, I think that um, th that, that will be the key reason uh, to you know, for us to be vigilant about vaccination as protection against severe illness. Now, I haven't talked at all about the globe. <clears throat> and we have a big problem uh, with um, vaccine access around the world. And as long as we have hot spots, we have surges anywhere in the world, I think if anything has taught us that we're all connected, yeah, it should be this pandemic. So the alpha, the first variant arose in the UK. Uh, uh, the Delta, I believe, um, arose in 
gosh, I get them mixed up. One was in Brazil, one was in one was in the UK, one was in Brazil, one was in Omicron was we think in Southern Africa, uh, one was in Asia. Um, and of course, the original strain was in Asia. We, I think it's Delta. We think came in from India. So you know, these um, uh, nobody has been able to protect themselves from the global spread of this variant. And uh, so as long as we have hot spots around the world, we're going to continue to see, um, you know, the, um, the virus adapt to people and to modify itself. Uh, uh, fortunately, Omicron um, modified itself in ways which were highly contagious, but not highly lethal. Um, so, you know, we also have to think uh, about how we're protecting the whole world and not just our own country. And what would that? Look well, that's like? making vaccine more available all around the world and making treatment available, and 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 it's beginning to happen. Um, you know, I, I think we could all debate whether it should have happened much more quickly. I want to talk a bit about um, ask you a couple of questions. You talk about the mm -hmm. inequities uh, and uh, mm -hmm. and how uh, COVID has disproportionately affected certain communities, particularly the Black community, African American community. Mm -hmm. The next and indigenous also a terrible devastation in Navajo Nation in wave one, for example. Yeah. Um, the list of things that impact that was deep and substantial right. and um, hard to tackle, I would say, yeah. or there's just a lot. And so what I would say is if, if you had to start somewhere, down that list of huge priorities to change that. What do you see as the most impactful or the right few things to start on? And then the logical question for us as Abney is, how can we help? But <laughs> let's start on where, where well, do you start? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in public health, increasingly you'll just hear people talking about vaccinations and treatment um, uh, because that's in our lane. Uh, and there, you know, we, we're very serious about delivering those to everybody who's eligible. Uh, but I think we also in public health have to talk about the importance of reducing exposure. And, and, and it's clear that at least in wave one, um, that, uh, that people who are classed as essential workers were far more likely to be exposed to the virus. So if, you know, obviously, First, you have to be exposed, then you get infected, and then uh, the, the outcome of your disease may also be modified by what kind of condition you're in at the time you get infected. So I think that the work that we've done in public health and ensuring, um, for example, that the mistake of not adequately protecting nursing home workers, home health uh, aides, uh, won't happen again, that they're now in New York State requirements that nursing homes have adequate stocks of protective, personal protective equipment, um, and that we have required that, um, that healthcare workers be fully vaccinated. And that's for the protection uh, of themselves, but also for the protection of the people who they care for. So this, these are all actions that had to do with reducing exposure. And we shouldn't forget about them. They're still all in place, but I'm, uh, you know, I, when we talk about vigilance, uh, we're talking about vigilance in terms of making sure that these resources remain in place. Uh, uh, but most of my time is spent talking about, um, you know, how we need to get the vaccination rates up and uh, get uh, at this moment, uh, a lot of that conversation is, uh, aimed at adults is about getting boosters. Um, you know, the question about the impact of racism in our society is one that really is our obligation, not just as professionals, but as citizens or residents. Uh, of, of this country, and and uh, and I agree with you. It's this is centuries in the making, and it, there's no magic bullet. Uh, but a good first step is the beginnings of a conversation. And uh, you know that none of this is natural. There's no reason that a person of African descent should have had a multifold higher risk of death. Uh, than, uh, than a person who's classified as white. There's no 
biological reason for that and we should not accept it. We should say, what do we do? Um, and that is lots of things. It's supporting public education, high quality public education. It's uh, you know speaking out against discrimination in the workplace. It's all of it. Question I have from from, uh, from from one of our 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 people on the Zoom. What um, are there any special efforts uh, being made for vaccinations and and boosting? Uh, for pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women, and especially women of color at this time? Well, we're working really hard to make sure that, that there's, a, a, you know, that everyone has the opportunity for vaccination, um, and uh, including working with kind of less traditional partners like uh, churches, for example, and community-based uh, organizations to, to sponsor vaccination sites. I think you ask a good question about uh, pregnant um, pregnant women and 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 women who are breastfeeding, and I I, I actually don't know the answer to that one. Um, uh, you know whether we have any special efforts. We certainly have been you know uh, trying to get out the information uh, that that it's uh, that there's no danger to you. I think that a lot of people are are not clear about that. I often, you know, I try to tell personal stories because, you know, for all of us, this affects not just the, you know, us as, as public health practitioners, but as as people. And and when my daughter was pregnant, she called me, asked, should I get vaccinated? And I said, yes, absolutely. And she uh, and I, she let me tweet it out. Uh, 20, 20, uh, eight weeks pregnant and vaccinated. She has a trusted person to call in her life. So I think that's <laughs> something a lot of us need. Um, look, I, I, it is very personal all of us. I, I, in the last week, for my, I, have, I have three little girls, they're three, six, and nine. My nine-year-old has gotten five emails in 10 days saying, you have been exposed at school. Oh, boy. And, and we never got those. By the way, she already had COVID. But, and she never got those emails before. And you know, I think mm -hmm. that I'll look at this with some degree of fear. I'm going to take that to just mm -hmm. a, a final question or two. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, when you showed the map of the wastewater down mm. the state where we are, you have little red circles and then yeah, the spot it's said lining hot up. Spots. So we yep. are in hot, hot spots. And so first, well, that's wastewater. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's there. <laughs> yeah. Is, is it, um, so we watch that and then you watch yeah. the three things, positive tests and you watch hospitalization. You, you just, is it, are there triggers you're looking for that you're seeing, or you're really kind of seeing that it's not, other than wastewater, you're not seeing much else at the moment? Well, in central New York, we're seeing an increase in case rates. That's it now. I mean, uh, 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 everywhere it's going up, by the way. It's ticking up. I, I don't know if I, I won't bring the slide back up, but you, you know, a 30% increase may be from eight uh, cases per 100,000 to 11. You know that the, these are low numbers. At one point during uh, during the Omicron surge, we had 400 cases per hundred thousand per day. So you know this isn't a different league. So we're we're talking about that tail, that low tail, and bumping up from that. And the proportional increases when you have small numbers, right? When you go from one to two, that's a 50 percent increase. So the Percent increases seem really big, but then the actual numbers remain small. Uh, but in Central New York, we are seeing um, we are seeing what looks like a, a, a disproportionate increase, still low, uh, but higher than it is in the rest of the state. But you don't see an inevitability that might be inevitability in terms of as, as numbers climb, they inevitably. No, but it, but we have the tools. <laughs> I won't hesitate to recommend to use them. I at this moment I don't see it. Uh, although I'm concerned, as you've gathered, about Central New York. Um, but uh, and and we're we, we're seeing upticks everywhere. But my small ones, and we have a more contagious variant. We have rel relaxed restrictions. We have a public that's tired of, you know, not going anywhere. Um, so all of these together, more mixing of people, uh, fewer, uh, you know, using methods like distancing, masking, uh, and a more contagious variant is a, it's inevitable that we're going to see some increase in transmission. Um, but uh, people seem to be 
prepared for that. What we don't want is a surge, and uh, and that um, you know that that that's what we're watching for. Doctor, thank you. It gives us mm -hmm. great uh, assurance that you are there. Uh, watching out over all of us at this incredibly complicated time. I do have one last question, a little off topic, and you can sure. feel free to decline. <laughs> Chocolate milk. Ah. <laughs> Chocolate milk, bad, bad for kids. Because I, I will say, by the way, I'm going to say I'm of this. I'm of the school. Like if you I didn't give my kids, kids chocolate milk, you know, it's good for kids to drink milk, but our kids aren't going to get rickets. We're not in a ricket era, and and I know that there have been concerns that kids who are deprived of chocolate milk don't get don't drink milk. Um, so we're having those conversations. Uh, the previous health commissioner was in favor of chocolate milk uh, in New York City. Uh, we, we worked hard to work with the schools actually to reduce um, uh, the, to change milk from to 1% uh, to milk um, and, uh, and to limit um, uh, flavored milks. So we're, we're having discussions. Okay, couldn't resist. Anyway. <laughs> Doctor, on a serious note, really, thank you so much. My pleasure. And uh, and look forward to continuing to hear from you. Thanks very much. Appreciated your questions. They were good questions. Hard questions, some of them. <laughs> thank you. Not the chocolate yeah. milk question. <laughs> I, we will get back to you on that. Okay. Thanks very much.